All right, we are live. Um, I've got my friend Mark here, Mark Goldberg, Mark Vlogs Watches, and I'm really excited to have him here streaming with me. So guys, if if you're watching this live, I'd like to shout out a few of you. I see Chris from the Watch Lounge. He was first. Dan is here. Wonder of Watches is here. So uh, it's really great to have you guys tuning in to a couple guys talking watches. And we've got a few topics planned. And if you guys have questions you want to talk about, please go ahead and put those in the comments section. Mark and I would be happy to uh, take a few questions. So I see Casey's here. Jerry's here. Random Rob is here. Hey, Rob, do you want to get on this stream? I can Come on, Rob. On. Get, get, on in, get in on this, Rob. <laughs> we'll take it easy on you. <laughs> uh, Chris says, no sound. Are we having troubles with the audio? Tell us if you can hear us, guys, just so we know. Yeah. Rob says, refresh. I'm not sure what he's saying. Mm -hmm. I hear you. I hear you just fine. Yeah, I hear you too. Sound, sound is, is good. good. All right. Awesome. Well, I'd like to introduce Mark here. Uh, I met Mark five years ago, around around five years ago, straight through the YouTube comment section. And uh, we got to we're chatting a little bit. Mark started his own watch channel, and I really enjoy his channel. But Mark is, uh, for your profession, you're a dog trainer. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that as we begin. Um, and Visman says, Mark is the first watch YouTuber I followed. Kudos. Well, Visman, I let me thank you for that, and let me also say that I hope your journey became uh, happier and more productive as the, you know as time went on. But thanks for following. And Bruce, I uh, I I met you approximately um, sixty five thousand subscribers ago. Congratulations, you've just blown up, and and nobody deserves it more for all the effort and good work that you've done. But what I noticed was the second I started making videos. You were just so welcoming and 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 so um, always had a kind word to say and 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 that is not all, not all that typical in this <laughs> in this watch world. So I just you know you you became a good friend and 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 what a good guy, guys. What you see with truth is what you get. This this is the real deal right here. I appreciate that, man. I'm I'm always of the opinion. Yeah. Hey, more the more the merrier when it comes to watch channels. More choice, more people doing it. I know it, it's not a threat to anybody, really. Wonder of Watch is saying that I made him buy his Seiko Patty Turtle. Well, you'll have to forgive me for that. Although, oddly, <laughs> I'm wearing a, uh, what is this? This is the the king. I, 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 this is your fault, Bruce. This is a Seiko King Turtle. <laughs> Excellent. I love to see it, man. The turtle yeah. is it's great. You lent so. me one, and that was the end of it. I had to have one. Yeah. Well, I've got a few questions here and I've, sure. I've, I'm learning StreamYard. So I've got a few banners here, but the first one I'd like to show is Mark, what is your favorite thing about being a dog trainer? Go ahead and elaborate as much or as little as you'd like to here with your profession. Well, you know how we all joke, but you know, it's not that much of a joke. Buried deep in the joke that we all have OCD is, is a kernel, if not a flaming core of truth. Right. And, um, so the first thing I think that I ever in my life became OCD about was dogs. Um, I was just born to be a dog person. Um, and it wasn't actually until much later in my life that I, that I realized that I was born in the Chinese year of the dog hmm. to a father who was born in the Chinese year of the dog. And both of us are nuts about dogs. This is a funny story. So um, yeah. I just became really obsessive and, and keyed into how they think, why I had one, I trained them, and then I wanted to learn everything. But um, so it was a very early obsession. It never really seemed like a, a matter of choice to me as just part of who, you know, my identity was, was this love of these creatures. But as far as the, um, the best thing, my favorite thing about being a dog trainer is that I, it's like living in a dog buffet, <laughs> you know, because I do boarding training, right? So the uh -huh. dogs live with me for a few weeks. And uh, any breed I've ever thought about or wanted to try on, I, I've been able to live with multiple times, shape them up and then pat them on the back and send them home. So I think my favorite thing is the variety of uh, breeds and temperaments and, and types of dogs, hundreds and thousands of individual dogs from hundreds of breeds. So I it's bet. like- it's like living in the buffet of dogs. It's, and you've been doing this for, for a number of years now. 
it's a frightening, it's almost scary, you know, how long I'm doing this. So by, uh, by age, I'm, I'm only 62, which is not, you know, but it's not young, but I've been doing this for 50 years because That's I started, fantastic. I started, That's fantastic. started so young. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, when most kids were, uh, were in print shop, most kids were printing up, you know, like rock album posters and stuff like that. I printed dog training business cards. <laughs> I love it. So really yeah. when, when you meet somebody that has 50 years experience mm -hmm. with something, that's a big part of who they are as a person, you are a wealth of knowledge and experience. And I don't think that can be understated. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. I've got a few more questions for you here uh, specifically, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, um, shoot, you are an author. I know you've published several mm -hmm. books. And so let me put this question up. How much work is involved in publishing one of your books? Uh, take us through that a little bit. I'm, I'm really curious. So, well, it's, 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 it's a little bit like childbirth or what I imagine, or what women will you know, tell you that childbirth is like, which is that um, it's long, it's arduous, it's inconvenient, it's painful. Um, and, um, and yet when that process is completed, you know, you've got your baby and uh -huh. you forget about all the awful stuff. And, um, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, you heal up and you want to do it again. So I, I always enjoyed writing always, uh, that's that really my, the, the two things that sort of came embedded in, in, in me and my DNA were, um, were writing and dogs. So I, I just never knew, right. When I was a youngster, I didn't know that I would get to make a living doing these things, but, um, I, I'm very, very fortunate. Look, I, um, one of one of my best friends is a New York Times bestselling author. He's a monk. Okay. He, he's on the cover of Let Dogs Be Dogs with me. Now um that that that's uh that's the monk and and then the other one is me. I'm the handsome one. Um, <laughs> you know. But that that uh, that monk um he's from the monks of New Skeet and um he wrote some best-selling books that have sold over a million copies, including wow. how to be your dog's best friend and the art of raising a puppy. So what uh, he advised me when I, I said, I got this dog book idea and um, he kind of coached me through it a little bit. Um, but I have to say it's a really daunting process. If you don't know what you're doing, um, I, I don't want to belabor this too much, but I also have a lot of experience in the editorial world okay. as a magazine editor also. And so I can pound out a, a 500 to 1200 word article in maybe an hour or two hours. Like I can just dash out an article. I did but not know that about you. Honestly, ever, that's really I, cool. I've written hundreds and hundreds of articles huh. and um, you know, but they are, uh, you know, they're small nuggets. They start here, they end here. Whereas uh -huh. a book is this giant, long, enormous journey. It's not like a 500 or a 1200 word. It's like 80,000 words <laughs> divided up into multiple concepts that eventually weave their way together. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like birthing a child. It's, like, it was, it sounds like it's very, very painful. So, um, uh -huh. you know, at the end of the day, I kind of told my buddy I was going to bail on the idea. And he said, now nah, I'll help you. Let's do it together. And that's how let dogs be dogs came about. But what happened was as we developed the process to write together, which neither of us had ever written with a co-author as we developed the process, it, it just worked well. We clicked, you know, he, we became like work wives in a way to one another. Mm. Um, if you ever have had that working relationship where you just dovetail with somebody that, yeah. you know, that you, that you're colleagues with. And, and so, um, when we were finished with that book, we needed time to recover because it's such a, uh, it's such an incredible labor. When, when I'm writing a book, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll end on this note. When I'm writing a book, I want to write in the morning and I'm not a morning person, but I force myself to get up and write in the morning before things get really busy. And, um, what I found is if I write in the morning, I can knock out like whatever word count I've established that I want to do on a daily basis. Uh -huh. And then um, my brain is tired after I do it. And I don't even want to look at anything, but by afternoon I've regenerated and I get a second writing period in. Yeah. Gotcha. So oh, that's great. I appreciate so, you humoring me there. Cause it's I, a painful, painful process. But if anybody ever has a book idea, I'd be happy to walk you through, you know, more detail, but that's uh -huh. the, the quick picture is it's a lot of discipline. And then look, I, when I had writer's block, 
my 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 co-author the monk said there's no such thing as writer's block he said that's a discipline issue uh -huh. sit there and write he goes even if you write badly we can fix it but if you don't write anything we can't so i realized wow makes sense. it's it's butt in chair time that i really have to commit to and so huh. he taught me let me uh, shout out a few more people here. We've yeah. got Steve joining from California. I'm glad you guys are here. We have about 78 watching at the moment. We might peak around 100, but I know we'll probably get a few thousand watch this over the next week. Nice. Um, young XLNC, cheers from Atlantic Canada, gentlemen. Great to see you guys. We've got Jean-Claude Beaver. Uh, the Big Wrist is here. Portological Freddy Krueger. Man, where do you guys come up with these names? These are awesome yeah. names. I love it. Alex is here. And he has a question. Let me highlight this for you, Mark. Um, a Basenji. He's got a Basenji. Yeah, I highlighted the wrong question. Excuse me. I'm uh, still learning this. Do you have experience with a Basenji? I don't know yeah, the Basenji that. is the African barkless dog. And forgive me for this, Alex, but to make it understandable to the rest of our viewers, it sort of looks a little bit like a pointier taller beagle They're a little hmm. beagle s uh, but pointier and taller at any rate um it's a african independent kind of a hunting breed they don't actually really have a traditional bark they chortle or yodel or scream when they're a little annoyed <laughs> so the answer is yeah i do I've, I've, they're a pretty rare dog um and i have a client who uh who owns two of them one is very mild and sweet, and the other is a little maniac, and I trained the maniac. But boy, that was not easy. <laughs> it was not easy teaching that boy to come back when called. So That's awesome. It can be a tough breed. We've got a, a question here from Watch Habit, wrist check, at Mark, and at Bruce. So uh, I know you've wrist kind of watch flashed your, your wrist, watch. Wrist, here, wrist, Yeah, we've you got know, the so, Seiko turtle. Yeah. Yeah, apparently I'm shooting on a potato. Sorry it's so fuzzy, guys, but this is my, my Wi-Fi right now. So, yeah, it's the Seiko King turtle. Um, I have a few other watches, but that, actually I took off a, uh, ooh, let's see. Yeah, I got to show you this. This is an H. Moser yeah. Pioneer Center Seconds. Let's that's, see that's, if we can get to focus. That is like prettier than a Calatrava. Ooh, it is so pretty. This, so nice this one, can... Moser is, is lending out. Um, and they sent it to Exquisite. I know we both have worked with Exquisite before, purchased from them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and great, they said, hey, send time. it to a client if you want. Let them wear it around for a weekend and uh, nice. get their opinion posted on Instagram. So I get to borrow this cool Moser here. That's for beautiful. They're at exquisitetimepieces.com, if I recall. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Good guys. And that's an incredible watch. That has so much history, that brand. I mean, I know they've been bought and sold multiple times. but uh, it, Correct me, Mark, but I believe they first started in Russia, right? They go back to Imperial Russia. That, that is like, so those, wild. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, so amazing stuff. Let me go back to one more question I have for you here. Watch out. Can you share a rewarding experience you've had while training? Well, you know, there, there, there have been so many. Um, a, lo a lot of times what happens, well, again, my, my, my co-author is a monk. So I remember one time saying to him, what's the best part of, for you of writing books? You know, because at the time I was thinking like, um, for me, it felt like a bucket list thing, which is like personal. Uh -huh. It felt like a legacy thing, which is personal. Leave a part of yourself behind. Yeah. And um, with his immediate and simple answer as a monk and an author, a best-selling author, he, um, he, he let me see how selfish my thought process was because he immediately says, oh, no, it's easy. He said, we get to help people that we never even met. We can help people. And so that really impacted me when I realized, yeah, th this is a helping profession. Um, you know, and uh, I've just have dealt with an awful lot of people who didn't want to disappoint the children by gotcha. getting getting rid of the dog, right? But if things, because I know you've got kids and you have a dog. Yeah, yeah. And just I've got a golden doodle and she is the best with my girls. My girls, they want to play with her all the time yeah. and, and they can probably get a little rough and she's just so sweet and so patient and I love it. I yeah. love having a dog. Those wow. are those are terrific dogs. But like, yeah. just imagine that there was some behavioral issue and you just weren't sure that it was safe to keep the dog, but you yeah. didn't want to crush your girls, right? Yeah. So sometimes we're able to uh, save that dog's home and which really, I'll tell you something, in my personal experience, if a child loses a dog, <clears throat> that stays with them all the way through the entire through their entire lifetime. Yeah. It, it'll leave a little bit of a mark. They'll recover, but um, but there's that a happened to mark, my mother. You know, yeah. I remember. I mean, 
to this day, she still talks about her Libby that died when she was about 12, 11, yeah. 12. So mm -hmm. I can I was, see that. When I was seven, um, my, my father tried to sneak a dog into the house and my mother wasn't having it at that time. <clears throat> and he was only there for a couple few weeks. Yeah. And I was like seven. Right. And, uh, but I never forgot that was a little, little, uh, miniature poodle. He thought he could make it work. <laughs> she was like, eh. I got kind of a funny story in that regard, Mark. Um, uh, so my wife, her, her grandpa came home with a dog. And so it's my mother-in-law, her and her siblings were all so excited. Oh, they got a dog and stuff, but he didn't talk to his wife before he brought it home. She was <laughs> not happy. And she gave him the silent treatment mm -hmm. <laughs> for, I don't know how long. And, and he's like, well, what do we got to do here? We can't return the dog. And you know, the kids are so excited. And she's like, well, you can buy me some diamond earrings and we'll call it good. <laughs> you know, guys, actually, I think you should take note of what Bruce is saying right now, because if you come home with that, with a new Rolex or a new motor, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and the wife is really upset, you know, in, uh, in, in, in Bruce's grandmother's experience, it's a pair of diamond earrings that'll do it. And by the way, if you buy those diamond earrings, yeah. And then it just so happens that you buy them from somebody who's also a Rolex authorized dealer. You're creating a buying history aren't you? <laughs> with a great profit yeah. margin for that jewelry. Heck yeah. A lot more than a, on a watch on a for watch. sure. Yeah, exactly. Hey, so, let's go to the comments real quick and then I'll, I'll let you wrap up your experience. But mm -hmm. we have Andy Adricos coming in here. It's good Andy. to see Andy. Jake W is here. Wonder watch is still here. Feel good. Constant <clears throat> dark star. I uh, just really appreciate you guys tuning in. And Motto83 says, Utes won. Look good today. He's in reference to my college team. I love the Utah Utes mm. here. So um, anyways, let's go back here. I, I kind of took you on a side. Well, I'll, here, Mark, I'll but. finish up. But but at first I want to, Robin C. asks, how is Clive? <clears throat> Clive is in the hospital, but improving every day. And oh. um, I've talked to him in, in the last couple of days. You know, I'm, I'm his horological mother, as you may well be aware, Bruce. But I, so I'm on his HIPAA, but I, I, I'm not supposed to really reveal, you know, what's wrong with him. It's hemorrhoids. Anyway, he'll be fine. <laughs> you know? This, this <clears throat> didn't happen because I joined you briefly on a stream, I think last week or so. It didn't happen. It was that right day. after that. Oh right my after. goodness. Because he was like, Hey, I don't feel good. I got to get out of here. And very shortly after that. Yeah. No, he, he, yeah, yeah. Um, he's, he's getting, but he's better. doing okay then, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thankfully he's getting better every day. It was a little scary there for a minute. You know? I'm glad to hear that. And I was really wondering if I could pick the lock on his apartment because God knows how many watches are, <laughs> you know, in the sock drawer. <laughs> you know, it, it, knowing your luck, you'd only find the the Parmigiani, right? <laughs> the find the, the Fleurier. Yeah, <laughs> it smells like cheese. <laughs> Keep, but it keeps good time. Oh, I'm glad he's doing well. So, um, well, look, I'll uh, wrap up with a quick story um, okay. about you know an, an, an experience. This is my own experience, right? So I talked to you a little bit, tiny bit about my childhood, but I'm going to tell you, I was an adult at the time. I was in my early forties and okay. I was teaching a class. I, I you know, I, I, sometimes I teach classes or I used to. And um, so I had this class and in the class was this beautiful collie and, but the collie was a brat. And every time the, the handler or the owner of the collie made a right turn during the healing pattern, okay. the collie would bite him in the left leg because <laughs> it was on his left side. So every time he'd make a right turn, that collie would just nail him in the right leg. And, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't my class. It was the, the next class over, but I noticed it because I was teaching mine and the poor guy was getting very frustrated. And I'm sure he was getting a sore leg. Right. So at the end of class, though, he came up to me um, and, and, and he said, did you see? And I was like, yeah, it didn't look pretty. Did it? And he was like, no. He said, do you, do you have like a solution? Like, what, what should I do? And this is a long time ago now. But um, I said, well, I said, honestly, I don't know until I hold the leash. I said, but I'm willing to, I'm willing to try to see, you know, what, what we need to do here. Uh -huh. And he said, yeah, please, please do. And I said, look, just fair warning. If he tries to bite me, I'm going to have to correct him." And he said, you good. You know, here. <laughs> good, good. I said, what's I his name? Stormy. Okay. Big male collie. Look just like Lassie, big male dog. By the way, Lassie was always a male dog playing a female dog, but they needed a bigger dog. So Lassie was always a series of male dogs anyway. And he looked just like Lassie. So uh, I make, you know, my first right turn. He looks at me a little, you know, give me a little side eye. I make my second right turn and he, but he doesn't go to bite me. I make my third right turn and he comes in for the bite. Now I saw it coming. Uh -huh. So I just gave him a pretty good leash correction. Good. 
And um, and then he was like, he, he, he was stunned, <laughs> uh -huh. and he began to heal like um, like the Joffrey Ballet. Like he he knew everything. Okay, he knew gotcha. everything. He was just too sort of bossy and resentful, I think, to do it. So, but he knew it. And um, anyway, when we finished, I just patted him down, and um, and Stormy fixed me with a look. Okay. This is this is the thing. Now, anybody out in the audience who who has ever had a collie, nobody else is going to know what I'm talking about now. But if you've ever owned a collie, say it in the comments. You're going to know exactly what I'm talking about when I say Stormy looked at me with collie eyes, it, which is a a a love. Okay, a direct fixed. He made direct eye contact, sustained direct eye contact, and just gave me these collie eyes, a soft, squishy, gooey look of love, as though he had found, you know, he wanted to come live with me. Like it was like he just had that moment with me. Wow. And um, and I'll tell you, something happened to me at that moment when he looked at me. He had a moment, okay, uh -huh. but I was also having a moment, Bruce. I mean, a very powerful moment this connection that we just made that started in conflict and ended up with this moment of pure love. Right. Uh -huh. So I handed the leash back to the guy and I had to run outside. I had to run outside the run outside the class building. It was in a national guard army. I just ran out into the parking uh -huh. lot because I, I knew I was going to burst into tears, which I did, which I did. Very emotional experience. And I broke down, but it was because when that dog looked at me, there I was at 40 years old, time warp. Uh -huh. I'm nine years old. My parents got involved in a pretty nasty divorce. And we got taken away from home. Uh -huh. Got installed in the home of a great aunt. All retirees in the neighborhood, no kids. The neighbor had a collie named Tippy. I, hadn't, I didn't even remember any of this, okay? Uh -huh. But the neighbor had a collie named Tippy, and Tippy was chained to his doghouse. His kids had grown up and moved away. He was older, and he was chained to that doghouse, living out his life, chained to that doghouse. They'd bring him in at night. And I spent most of my days in that doghouse with Tippy, who looked at me with those same eyes, you know? And that's when I realized, oh, my God, this is probably why I'm a dog trainer, because even before I owned my own dog, right? Uh -huh. Crazy. So is that the, I, I've seen a it picture of you, Mark. Room. Yeah. Of uh, you're you're kind of holding up a dog. Yeah, you're on your sure. back. Is that Tippy? No, that's uh, that's not that that's a Sheltie. Here, I'll I'll find you that picture. Okay. This photograph is in is in it's in uh, Let Dogs Be Dogs, and it's uh, there we go. Yeah. Um, I'm 14 years old in that picture, and that's my first my first dog, Gus, the one we didn't get rid of. <laughs> uh -huh. Anyway. Yeah, so beautiful thing. Got a comment here. The big wrist, big wrist says, "I owned a collie for twelve years. Great dogs. They will bond with you like a child. One of the best dogs I've ever owned." Yeah, that's great. So, that's awesome. It kind of goes back. Uh, sorry, uh, let me let me close off this uh, banner here. I think it kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier. Where if you're in a position, you've you've got to find a solution. You can't just get rid of a dog, you know. Because I don't know. I think. Yeah. Once you commit to to purchase a puppy, add it to your family, I mean, that's a big commitment. You can't just yeah. say, you know, sorry after, you know, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Don't give up. I mean, look, there's so much help. Um, even, you know, dog trainers, I, like the internet is a scary, goofy place because just like on watches, there's so much conflicting information. Um, but, you know, I, I've written a couple of good books, <laughs> you know, that might help you. And um, here, here's the new one. Uh this is the new one. This is a very good book. I uh, honestly, if uh, if I didn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have written this book if somebody else would have. But it just it needed to be written, um, and uh, so it's got a you know a good training program in it. But there's there's tons of really good dog trainers out there. I, I guess ultimately, what I want to say is the things that. Um, disturb most people about their dogs or worry them. You know, the people who call me, they can't believe the dog's doing this, that, or the other. Most uh, of it's, most of it's fixable, you know? Yeah. And I'm guessing a lot of it is, is not actually the dog. It's probably the owner, right? Well, a lot of times they, people just don't know what to do. Right. And uh, naughty dog uh, behavior, just like naughty kid behavior is usually driven by boredom and frustration. So if we uh, can address that. So basically, I guess what I'm saying is if your dog hasn't put stitches in anybody, chances are we can fix that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Dark Star says, get a rescue dog. I've got three of them. 
And, and uh, I think I missed a comment earlier, but someone asked, how many dogs do you personally have, Mark, earlier? I have three. Um, now, mind you, two of my three dogs are purebred dogs, but they're also rescue dogs because there's lots of purebred dogs that lose their, you know, lose their homes. One is a beautiful German Shepherd. One's a rat terrier and then have a Border Collie mix. I think he's mixed with a little bit of pit bull. Uh -huh. So I, I live with uh, I live with three dogs of my own and then, you know, a bunch of client dogs at any given time. Sure. There's one more question here. I would sell all of my watches to save my dogs. Me too. You know what? Honestly, I would go watchless if I had to, to save my dogs. Fortunately, we don't have to do that. <laughs> That's true. Let's talk watches here, actually. Yeah. Mark. Um, well, I've got a few topics written down. And guys, please jump in if you're watching this live. If you have a question, if you have a topic you want to talk about, we're happy to take a few questions here from the chat. We're really happy that you're here tonight. So, um, Mark, I want to ask you, how are you bonding with the gold Submariner? Love well, you, one. yeah, you got a, you, Bruce got a good look at my gold Submariner. You, you made a terrific video on it. We, we went in on the macro level. I could practically see the AU in the gold <laughs> when, you, when you zoomed in there. Sure. Um, so, uh, I, well, first of all, it's a, it's a beautiful piece. Um, mind you, I'm, I'm a weird collector in the sense that, um, it, it took me a long time to realize my primary genre is dive watches. Yes. Right. Like so guys, such right? a great style of watch. Yeah. Well, and what it comes down to is I just, I, I honestly, I think it's the bezel. <laughs> it's like having a fidget spinner. It's like something to play with. Yeah. Um, but I like the fact that they're robust. I like the fact that they're sporty. Um, I definitely want to get them wet. I, I, I never put a diver on a leather because I, for whatever reason, I want to be able to shower with them or go into the swimming pool, which I like never do. Sure. <laughs> you know, Even silly things like washing your hands. I'm sure you have to do a lot, and you're constantly. I pick up poop for a living too, right? So, yeah. you know. But uh, anyway, so um, and I love I love every modern iteration of the of the Submariner. Now, like most of you guys, I had to go through a lot of. I had to make a lot of mistakes before I kind of, re, you know, found my lane, right. Or my groove, but, um, the gold Submariner, it's like the pinnacle of the Submariner. So it, 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 it has a welcome place in my collection. I, for me, I don't feel like it's an everyday watch because I don't work at a desk. I don't work in an office. I work in, you know, in a kennel, in a field. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm like banging into things all the time for, you know, for work. Um, and so, uh, but I, I, I often put it on after work or if, you know, it's pandemic, so there's nowhere to go. But if I was going somewhere that I wasn't yeah. nervous to get mugged, I'd wear it there too. But sometimes I just put it on when I'm in my bathrobe just to like, look at it. <laughs> I love it, man. I love to hear it. It's a beautiful thing. Chris has a question for you, Mark. Do you see yourself buying any Holy Trinity pieces? Um, well, the problem, as I've said many times before with the Holy Trinity is they're all in French, okay? So I, I really don't love the idea of buying a watch which I can barely pronounce. I mean, Rolex, 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 <laughs> Rolex. I mean, Hans Wilsdorf literally picked a name that could be pronounced. There we go, the Rolex. Now, that, of course, is a Vacheron et Constantin. If I can now, get I, focus. I'd like there we go. There, there we go. Now I'd like you to while you're watching, while you're looking at Bruce's magnificent watch, and it is a beautiful thing. I want you to watch my mouth as I attempt to pronounce the name of that brand and watch the pain come over my lips. Vacheron et Constantin. I mean, <laughs> you literally have to hurt yourself to say Aldi Mal. Watch this. Aldi Mal. I mean, I don't think the jaw is meant to do that. Aldi Mal Piguet. And uh, Patek Philippe. Basically, you have to be an arrogant professional Parisian, you know. Yeah. So I'm not big on the French names. Rolex, Aldi Malpiquet. So you know what, guys? Here's the thing. I, I don't think I deserve the Holy Trinity. I think those are for people who are less snobby than me and more into horology. I, I have a problem. You know, I, I like Rolex. And Well, you know what? You know. I think that's fantastic because you know what you love and you don't have to take side routes because someone else says this is what you should be doing. Cause you know, that sub is a $30,000 plus watch. You could have gotten a number of different, uh, high horology pieces like this. Um, sorry, that VC that I, yeah, that I picked up. I mean, this is a 19,000. You could have bought this. You could have bought an extra Rolex for the amount that you spent roughly on a sub. So 
I think it's great that you're just going with what you love and who cares what anybody else. You thinks. just I mean, I got to get, you just got to get comfortable with it. I mean, I get it. The, the problem is I love the junk food as much as I love the fine dining. Okay. So on, on some level, I get just as much pleasure. Look, 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 I'm going to be like a little kid. Okay. Although, this is a, you know, although this is a Seiko turtle, I put it on the strap, put it on the, the strap code. Yes. Right. So that I could. Adjustable. Uh, you know? Yeah. Like this is just having fun with watches. Right. I have a Cartier diver um, that I just trade out straps on just to make it look different. Um, and I just have it on, like I have a $6,000 Cartier on a, $20 silicon strap, you know, but it looks, it looks fun. Yeah. So I, I think when watches cease to become fun, you know, you got to evaluate what you're doing here. Uh, they, it doesn't always have to be super expensive to be enjoyable. I think. I totally agree with that. Let me highlight a comment here from Rob who says Breitling super ocean 42 is my next purchase. I think that's awesome. I have one. Mark and I, yeah. we both kind of share this love of yeah. Breitling. I mean, it's such a fun brand. It's, it's like a, a brand. it's a dirty hat. It's a, what, what should we call it? A guilty pleasure? <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's definitely a guilty pleasure. So. I, I do like them. I like them. I've had a lot of different Breitlings, and um, I like the heritage. I I, I like I kind of like the heritage Super Ocean. Um, I have the I have the rainbow one the black rainbow one, one of 250 pieces, which is a crazy story that I was able to get that because they made 250 of them is all. So but, you didn't uh, end up selling that then you were thinking about it, right? I'm on the fence, you know, I'm on, I'm on the, I look, honestly, I probably should sell it. Um, yeah. and the reason is, is that, um, I went and bought a, um, the, the 42 millimeter chronomat, uh-huh. Not all that long thereafter, figuring that I would use one to fund the other, and then I didn't. <laughs> so. You just got you just have both, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, tell us, tell us about that chronomat because that was probably your most recent purchase, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it would be, or at least, yeah, n- no, it is. Um, it it has that roulette bullet bracelet. Mm-hmm. Um, it's beautiful. The bracelet doesn't pull hair. Uh, what is it that Tim Moss always says? Trap hair, pull skin. I mean, he's got a he's got his, pull hair, and yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. He's the master. Sixteen and a third know. centimeter. Rep. <laughs> yeah, I'm like got, talking inches. I'm not. <laughs> he's got quite a rep. Yeah, but anyway, the only the only complaint that I think I could make about it <clears throat> about the bracelet is um, it doesn't it doesn't have micro adjustments, and mm-hmm. I don't and it and according to my watchmaker, it doesn't have half links. Now I have you know, all the little screws and, you know, fixtures and stuff to do my own like strap changes. Yes. But, um, however, I, I looked up a video on that one and then I was like, you know, I don't want to do it when I, when I, myself, I was afraid. So when I took it to my watchmaker, he was like, it's good that you didn't because that bullet bracelet has pins and sleeves, which are typically a little hard to work with. Yeah. He said, but the sleeves are very, very long and you need a special tool. Uh, to like knock them out. Otherwise you're going to bend the, the, you'll bend the collar. He said, and if you bend the collar, they're custom, you know, it'd be hard to recreate it. Gotcha. Um, but anyway, he was able to make a fit for me that was kind of like either loose or tight. So I took it loose, you know, Good. but I'm um, all about Bruce loose is, as, as Rob calls it. I, I, I like, like it loose and sloppy too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But you know why I have wrist claustrophobia. If it's too tight, I get like anxiety. Like, and then That's if just you, not comfortable, you know, if you, you, you have your wrist in a certain position and then you move your watch and you get an indentation and, Oh no. You thing. know, my dad barely can take an elevator. And if he has to get an MRI or something like that, where they got to slide him into the tube, oh, yeah. they have to, they have to knock him out. They have to trank him because he has bad claustrophobia, real and, claustrophobia. Yeah, no, for real. It's a real yeah. serious thing. But in all my life, I sort of like mocked him a little for like, you know, if, if he, he would rather walk six flights of stairs than take an elevator. He's worried. Right. And I don't have that. But then one day I realized my, my watch was like one notch too tight, you know, on a, like I actually own very few uh, bands for a watch that aren't a bracelet with micro adjustments. Very few. In other words, where you got to pick a hole. Yeah, exactly. Because if it's too tight, I get like freaked out. I become like my father. I need, I need tranquilizers. <laughs> and that's probably one of the reasons why you enjoy Rolex so much. Cause you either have easy link or yeah. you have the glide lock, which is just fantastic. They do and a great the, job. Yeah. And one of the reasons I don't so much like the old style stuff, although, you know, 
really, um, if you're, um, if you have the old style stuff, I, I would just keep toothpicks around. In fact, I do keep toothpicks around so that you can poke the spring bars and do your micro adjustments. Uh, don't you don't use a paper clip, guys. Uh, scratch your watch up. Use a use a toothpick. I want to welcome Latrell Bailey. First time here. Bruce, you're that dude. <laughs> I don't know exactly dude. what you mean by that dude, you but are that dude. I appreciate that you're being here. Welcome to the to the stream, mm -hmm. Latrell. So guys, do you have any questions for, for uh, Mark and myself? Please go ahead and put those in the chat if, if you have any of those. If, if you don't, no worries. But um, I mean, I have a few here written down. But I want to ask you, Mark, what are you looking at next? I know we've talked a little bit. We have your names down for a few watches. Let's talk about it. Okay. So, um, you know, the, 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 the list, you know, the whole concept of the list. The, the list is a very complicated concept. Um, so whether, when someone tells you that they're on the list, you know, you don't really know if there's a list or not, cause it's going to vary so much, right? The, list or the bad list, the real list or the, you know, look, <laughs> a, a lot of people go into the authorized Dior and they put themselves on the list and, um, and, you know, before the guy is out the door, the slip of paper is, you know, in the garbage or it's in a book that nobody ever, you know, looks at again. Yeah. And, um, and I understand from the perspective of the authorized dealer, um, well, it's a lot better to put you on a list, whether it's a real or imagined than it is to laugh in your face, you know, which is what some guys report. Yeah. Um, you, you gotta remember that, um, Rolex is a manufacturer and all these ADs, they're actually not affiliated with Rolex other than they have yeah. um, distribution contracts. That's, you know, and, and so they're all different, you know, some of the chain corporate ones are very arrogant and they've got corporate policy and rules that they have to follow. And, you know, then there's a ton of mom and pop shop ones where you're dealing with the owner and, and, and that may be better. So the, that is, that is a, a very long way of saying I'm on the list, Bruce. <laughs> but in your instance, I believe you. I mean, I'm you've on the list. several watches from this dealer. And, and they've always put me on a list and they've always been able to eventually, <clears throat> you know, in, in, a, in, in, in a reasonable time, sure. you know, which I'm, for which I'm very grateful. Um, and, and if I may, yeah. Mark, I, mm -hmm. I, I like that you mentioned a reasonable amount of time because so much of the time we're always like, you know, we want things now I've got money to spend. My money is, is, is worth a lot. You should be treating me like a King. But a lot of these dealers, man, they get two sky dwellers a year and they've got 200 people asking for it. And they all have the money for it. They all have the money. Yeah. So you, you it know. comes down to like, I waited, what was it? Eight months for my Hulk which I think is actually, no, that was quick. That's, oh, that, yeah. yeah, that's pretty quick. There's people waiting. Don't. Look, you know what? Um, I, I occasionally get contacted for dog training by somebody who wants to, um, you could just tell when you're talking to them who wants to um, use the power of their money to get the booking dates that they want. Even if, even when those are sold out, cause I usually have a bit of a waiting list. Right. Gotcha. And when I hear somebody difficult on the phone or in person, I, or even let's, and sometimes these are wealthy and powerful people. Yeah. Um, sometimes not. Um, but, but that being said, I would way rather work for a teacher who really had to sacrifice to raise the money for her dog than for a rich guy who could just like peel it off in hundred dollar bills, but it's going to give me a hard time about it. Right. Exactly. So, um, it's much nicer when you're selling something to sell it to because every it's the same money. It's the same money. Your money is the same as my money. And if you're a lot nicer than me, which by the way, you probably are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> then um, you're going to be more likable and, and, and you're likelier to get a break. So, um, but I, I established a buying history with uh, this authorized dealer, um, I'll just mention their name. It's as a, as a courtesy, James and sons. They've got a few outlets in, in and around Chicago. I go to Orland park. Uh, Brian's the manager there. And this is what I found. He's actually hooked up a few of my subscribers with steel sports. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Who didn't, who didn't have big buying history. So you never know, but I will tell you this. Um, I'll, t I'll tell you this. It, it pays to just go in and, and, and not to be demanding, to be nice, to ask what they have available, to yeah. express your interest, to ask if you can put your name in, and then to stay in some sort of reasonable touch without nagging. 
Exactly. And, um, you know, that's the thing. And I don't, I think that's like every six or eight weeks, either drop by or blow a text or a call in. And, and, yeah. and, and at the same time too, if you can, if there's something that, you know, if you need to, if you need to get out of Dutch with your woman and you need those diamond earrings, go there and buy them. Do it. Yeah. That, that can't be understated at all. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Let me take a couple questions here. We've had a few, um, pop up as we've been chatting. Um, sorry, where was the one I wanted to start? It was, so you guys are moving pretty fast. Here it is. What was your first watch that started you down the rabbit hole? Please go ahead and take it away, Mark. Well, in my case, it was, uh, it was a bunch of, it was Seiko's, um, in the seventies. I always, but mind you, they if both, you would have kept on holding on to those Seikos from the yeah, 70s. yeah. It was it was Seikos in the seventies, and um, but they were not nearly as robust as they as they are today. At least not the ones that I bought. I mean, eventually they'd get water damage, or the crystals would just get so scratched up that you couldn't use them anymore. Um, I always liked automatic watches, so I usually had an automatic, not um, not a quartz, and I could and usually they were and I I still remember what they cost back then, and you had to go to a department store to get them. Um, so and I needed one watch about every year and a half to two years, because um, they would just like you know just get destroyed. But they were about seventy dollars, and uh, I was just always fascinated by them. And then when when I could afford my first real watch, um, it was in the mid eighties. And I mean, it's such a bad decision. I mean, it's a cute watch, but I could have had, you know, the Submariner. What would a 1987 Submariner be worth now, you know? But um, I bought a 34 millimeter two tone date uh, Rolex. This looks like a date just except for it's 34 millimeter, not 36, with a Jubilee two tone bracelet. Well, and that I, wasn't the rage though in the 80s. Well, it was the uh, that was the I've made it watch. And I was a young, obnoxious Turk who thought I had made it. That's so awesome. I, I'm, oh, sure awesome. I, I'm sure I bought it for the wrong reasons, but I still have it. Uh, Kenny Nguyen from Jewelers on Time in California restored it for me. Uh, he did a lovely job, and uh, it looks looks like new. I, I I don't wear it often, but I I couldn't part with it either. Yeah, let's go. Uh, actually, I'll answer that real quick, and then we'll yeah. go comment. For me, it was it was a watch I never owned, but I was I was a kid. I was probably you know ten or so. The one that got away. And yeah, well. Uh, I grew up in Alaska and when I was about 10, like there wasn't a ton of stores. Where, where in Alaska? In Anchorage. I mean, it's the biggest yeah. city, but um, we would get off from Juno. Oh, from Juno. Awesome. Yeah. We would get these catalogs. We had all these catalogs that you can choose things and we would order all sorts of stuff. And I remember looking through this catalog and seeing a pilot watch and I just thought it was the coolest thing. It had a brown leather strap. That's really all I remember about it. But I just wanted it so badly. I never ordered it. But um, that's when I first became cognizant of watches. Do you and have an IWC? No, but um, I might. I love the Le Petit Prince. I love the chronograph. I'd love to try it sometime. Or a I, Zin. How about a Zin? They make some nice pilot watches. They do. In fact, let's go to the next comment. Yeah. Zin856. Or JDD Marathon for a tool watch. This is from Cowboy Swami, awesome member of our watch community. Mm -hmm. So, um, what do you think? Because you have experience, I know with the with the marathon, right? Well, I I I have one. In fact, it was a rebuy. <laughs> you know, I have the I have Jeff McMahon disease. By the way, I really enjoyed your interview with Jeff. Um, he's he, the best. Yeah, I love yeah, Jeff. Yeah, he's a great guy, tortured soul, which is what I love about him. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but, um, the, 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 the sickness that is the rebuy is something that, uh, you know, something that Jeff McMahon talks about a whole lot. And, uh, and I have that I've rebought multiple watches and the, the jump, the JDD marathon is one of them. It makes the James Cameron look small. It's like 46 millimeters by like 18 thick. It's, it's just ginormous. So I guess cowboy, I don't know the, the, the Zen eight, five, six. But what I'd say is, man, if you have under an eight inch wrist, the JDD, it's a lot to pull off. You know, I have a seven and a quarter inch wrist, just like my buddy over there. You got to, you know, we're, we're wrist buddies yeah. and, um, you know, and I can just about carry it off. So I would say if you're seven and a half, even you could, you could carry off a JDD marathon and it has tritium tubes, which is cool. Cause like, you know, we, we like things that glow in the dark and, and that does provided it's not old, you know, and used up. 
I'm with you, Mark. Uh, I think the marathon would likely be better when it comes to uh, value for money because Zins, they've really been just going up in price over the years. Yeah. So you pay for the watch, but man, is it a nice watch. Really well calculated and, and uh, like the, the tagamenting. I don't know if you want to get an 856 that was tagamented, but if it was me, I'd, I'd probably want to get the Zin just because I like the design, but I recognize I'm paying through the nose to get a Zin. I think it's worth it though. I don't know. I don't know what it costs, but I know you could probably, you know, if you're patient, like the spider to the fly and you really watch eBay and the forums, you, you could probably get a marathon, a, J, a jumbo day date marathon for like 900. Let's do a, let's do one more here, Mark. Would you guys get a Daytona or is it worth it to obtain it in the gray market? Yeah, that's actually, I, you know what? I got so so twisted in my story about the list that I forgot to tell you. That's what I'm on the list for. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Let's finish that. Let's finish that. So I'm on the list for the, for the, for, for a Panda Daytona. They're very hard to get yeah. your, your authorized dealer. Um, you know, they have to like you really in order to get you one of those, or you have to be like a spectacular customer. And the reason is they get so few and the, the demand is so crazy high. Um, it would be very, very rare for this to be your first Rolex. Very, very rare. I agree. So, you know, unless you're like a celebrity or something like, look, I watched a video. Um, it was a, um, Eric back when he was with watch your style. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he's got his own channel now. He does. Know? He has his new, his new channel. He went out on his own to become his own dealer. But at any rate, he made a video four years ago, um, saying how much he liked the Panda and he had one. You know, and he was showing it how much he liked it, but that the chances of getting one at the authorized dealer are slim to none, which is definitely true. Mm -hmm. Very hard, very, very hard. You have to have a really good relationship. Um, and and he said, and on the uh, it's like to get out the door with one, it's like 13, 14, because back then it was a little cheaper. And you have tax to pay, right? So you could get out the door with that with one four years ago when he made that video for about thirteen thousand dollars. And he said the premium. Uh, price at that time was $18,000. Right. And he said, damned if I'm going to pay a premium of $5,000 over retail. No way, no how. Now I'm sure right now he's wishing he would have bought five of them. Yeah. You know, because the premium now is well over, it's over, it's more than $10,000. So wild. I went I on Chrono just to look and there is a butt ton of them for around 28, the, the Panda. Man, 28. It's nuts. It's, it's approximately, it's more than double retail. So, yeah. so which is, which is crazy. So Frank and bones, here's the problem. You'll almost certainly have to buy it, you know, gray market or used from, from chrono or some trusted source like that. I mean, stick with a trusted source because you're really buying the seller when you're buying a watch that, that heavy, you know, over premium, well, there's that well publicized of um, what was it, Horology House that yeah. kind of got red handed with that exact watch. Yeah. yeah, so you have to you have to be like you know extremely careful. But that being said, um, if you buy one, you want to know that you're going to hold it for like a really long time. Is I guess what I'm saying because if you go to if you if you if you get it and then you decide you know you spend twenty say you get a good deal and you get one for $25,000. Oh my God. Um, which really you could go buy precious metal for less than that. Right. Yeah. yeah that's what I would recommend. <laughs> Don't but, let, but let's say, you know, that you just got to do it. So you do. Um, and then if you decide, you know, I, I didn't like it all that much. I want to recycle the dollars. You're going to lose, you know, 20, 25% on it. If you sell it like within a year, uh, or you'll have to take chances uh, by selling it direct, you know, direct to an end user, and then you'll pay fees on eBay and, and you'll take chances of fraud. So if you're absolutely sure, then by all means, it, it's going to hold its value, but you, yeah. not if you sell it fast. And if, if I were to answer that, if I was offered either a black or a white dial, I'd go down to the authorized dealer that day and say, oh, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, it's such a great size, great design. Um, I would buy a day to Personally, I wouldn't buy it on the gray market just because you know, if I'm spending that premium, I have to be head over heels in love. And even then the principle of it <laughs> would be hard for me to swallow. I'd rather, you know, put that money. Yeah. But look again, there was, there was Eric five years ago going, I'm not paying 5,000 ever, but boy, if, if he would have known the future, he might've done it. Yeah. That is a good point. So let's see. Um, 
let me try to catch up here on the uh, on the chat. We have Steve who asks, does anyone actually know someone who's paid these crazy premiums on the secondary? I've yet to meet or talk with anyone who has just all of us lamenting about it. You know what, Steve? I, I've actually talked to a few viewers that email me and they're like, hey, I can get this Batman or this. It hasn't been a Daytona, but it's it's usually a stainless steel sports model. And they say, I don't, I realistically don't think I can get it from an authorized dealer. Should I buy it? And how much should I be paying? So I've I've talked with guys that are legitimately, you know, looking at paying a small premium. Most recently with the C dweller, because that one only has like a fifteen hundred, two thousand dollar premium. And I know Mark, you have this watch. Uh -huh. Yeah, the red line. Yeah. And uh I think that's that's like a heck of a watch. I you know, it's it's actually probably less popular than the sub is right now, which is kind of wild. Oh, well, most things are less. The sub is one of the most popular watches out there. I, I look, Rolex makes divers other than the sub, but the sub is the classic, so that's the one that people fight for more. You know, yeah. what I mean? and then also just to add on to that, uh, Steve, I'm part of a couple Facebook groups where you're. It's usually dealers, and they're buying and selling between each other, and I've seen, you know, Rolex. Let me pull it up. The Hulk. I know Mark and I both have this watch. Um, this it's not selling for high dollar, but you know, 17,000 they're being sold. People are, are picking those up. So it does happen. I don't know how often it happens at least for, you know, $28,000 Daytona. I don't know how often that happens, honestly, but what, what's your take, Mark? Do you think people are paying these premiums? You know, well, yeah, that, yeah, they are. Um, they are. It, those of us who wrap our heads around videos, like the one we're doing right now, I mean, we're real, um, we live in, we, mentally. We live in this world of watches, right? So I think what happens is we we're um, we're we're a little bit bargain oriented. So the whole idea of paying a premium offends us. But there's people who have the money, you know, who yeah. just don't care. It's only money, they say, right? That's right, and they have it, you know. And so the the value of money it's different to all of us, right? Like honestly, I would have a hard time paying retail for a Daytona if I thought I might like lose a bunch of money if I wanted to sell it. It's one of the reasons I typically like my Rolex Steel Sports. First, the rugged nature of those watches appeal to me, but the value retention does also because by the time you turn around and you go, oh my God, I've, look how much money I've got tied up in watches. It's like a little scary, you know, like re relative to your to my net worth. I have too much. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, there's something wrong with me. I need to I, sell watches. I, I do not have that diversified of a portfolio. <laughs> yeah. And so um, knowing that there's some value retention there gives me a little bit of comfort because I, I feel like I could recycle the dollars when I need to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why some people do that um, for, for specifically for Rolex. But I think that, um, listen, guys, if you go on Rolex Collectors World, which is, you know, I don't know, got like 50,000 members on Facebook. If you post up a picture of Hulk, 20 guys are going to post a picture of their Hulk, you know, post up a Panda. 30 guys are going to post up their Panda. Most of them will have gotten them off of the gray market and they just, they didn't mind spending the money. Yeah. What kills me is some of these guys are like 20, you know, like, I don't know, I don't know how they do it. Where'd you get that money? I didn't have that when I was 20, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Me either. I was spending $70 and, you know, having to scrape to get it. Yeah. Um, let's, let's take maybe one more question. I want to be, uh, mindful and respectful of your time, Mark. I know we're almost, we're getting close to an hour and there's 143 people watching us at the moment. Thanks for being here guys, but let's, we've gotten a couple questions about the Speedmaster. So let's, let's pull up Craig's comment who says chat about the alternative Omega Speedmaster with the new model coming goodbye now. I'm guessing that's a question. Mm. So let me pull, I know, I don't think you've owned one, Mark. You have owned. Never one? owned. A, I never owned a speed. Never been into the Speedmaster, right? You know, I'm 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 not that big into chronographs. I do have the Chronomat, and I'm on the list for the, you know, the list again for the Daytona. Uh -huh. But um, I have to say, I like the Speedy for other people. I don't dislike it at all. I think it's a cool, iconic, really, really kind of important historical watch that just doesn't do that much for me for whatever reason. So that answers this question, Mark. Have you ever? <laughs> Speedmaster. Well, you know, I, I, um, 
you, you can't swim in them. <laughs> and that bothers me. That's why my chronographs have typically come from Breitling and they have like, you know, 200 meter water ratings. So to, to get back to your question, um, uh, that was Craig, right? Um, so I've seen, I've got it on my computer, the other screen right over here. I was sent the spec list probably I, from someone who probably shouldn't have sent it to me. So I know all about, you know, all the changes for the new Speedmaster. I've seen the renders. I've seen Omega's pictures. I know what's coming out. I know the price. Um, I'll be respectful and not divulge too much, but the new watch is going to be awesome. It's going to have a nice taper on the bracelet. It's not going to change all that much, but it will get the new Metis movement, which is going to be a big upgrade. Uh, over the 1861 and the 1863, I have the 1863 in my Sapphire sandwich. But the nice thing is Omega is, is they're not raising the price all that much. I, it's going to be around $1,000 more expensive for both the Hesalite and the Sapphire versions. And I was expecting Omega to really bump up that price. I thought we would be seeing Speedmasters that cost seven and $8,000 new at retail. So um, is, it, is this a good purchase now because it's being discontinued? I think your money is going to be safe because it will slowly go up in value just because, you know, the new watch, the latest and greatest is going to be a little bit more expensive, but I don't think it's going to be that drastic. So I would just encourage you buy whichever one you like, you know, if you like the older version, the current version, or you really like the new upgrades and you're okay spending an extra thousand dollars. I don't think it's going to be that big of difference either way. But um, yeah, that's that's my opinion there. Hopefully, I answered your question. Well. I I wonder if a lot of guys, as soon as the new one comes out, will dump their old one in order to upgrade to the new one, which will very temporarily depress the price of the old one, yeah. and then it'll become a classic and start to rise back up. So I if think there's a spot on. Yeah, if there's an opportunity, it's going to be right after the uh, you know within six months after the new one comes out. And then after that, that opportunity will be gone. So maybe take advantage of some fool that wants to upgrade and you know send him a slightly obnoxious offer, right? Is that the quote obscene offer? What well, would you say? Uh, I, I, you know, offensive. I like to make the offensive. <laughs> if my seller didn't cry, I did it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I, I think we'll kind of wrap it up here, guys. Robert says, don't forget to thumbs up the video, guys. I appreciate that, man. Um, next time, if you want to jump in, you're more than welcome anytime, Rob, to... Uh, I'll send you the link and you can join the stream. But I appreciate you guys being here. There's 143 of you in the chat right now. Thanks for taking some time. Big thank you to you, Mark. Um, actually, real quick, before we close, I want to share uh, what I remember of when we kind of... <laughs> I hate you so much. Yeah. So so I don't remember what video it was. It was one of my... <laughs> and I was going through the comments and this Mark Goldberg said something... Oh. I wish I saved it. I, I don't know where it is, uh, but I read it a little snarky and I was kind of like, who is this guy? Is snarky? He? Me? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I just, I, I, uh, I responded to you. I think it was a question about a movement. I don't know what uh, it was, but I'm so glad I didn't get huffy and puffy <laughs> to go take a hike or jump in a lake because it's just been so great to get to know you over the past few years. And for those of you guys that don't know, I've had Mark over to my home the last time he was in Utah and uh, just such a great guy. So uh, thanks for being here, Mark. I appreciate thanks, it. Bro. Thanks. Thanks so much for putting up with me, Bruce. <laughs> oh, no, no. And maybe, I, maybe you didn't even make a snarky comment. You know how uh, it is when you're reading something. Sounds like me, though. It does. It sounds a little like me. I could believe. Listen, a little of me goes a long way. We know this. <laughs> so, so thanks. Um, thanks for tuning in, guys. And thanks, Mark. So we're going to end the stream now. Appreciate it. And uh, have a good evening.